Hello and welcome to the Further Math Support Programme Revision Recordings for A-Level Modules. Today we're going to be looking at Edexcel Mechanics 2 and this is the fourth part of this. Today we're going to be looking at Centre of Mass and at Statics. This is one of uh, five recordings that are being made um, for Edexcel Mechanics 2. The other recordings should be available in the same site that you found this one on. So let's take a quick look at the um, specification from Edexcel for the topic on uh, Centres of Mass. Students need to know about how to find the centre of mass of a discrete mass distribution in one and two dimensions. That's basically um, to locate the centre of mass for a system of point masses or uh, particles in one and two dimensions. You also need to be able to find the centre of mass of some standard uniform plane figures, uh, triangles, rectangles, etc., which we'll look at in more detail. And some simple cases of composite plane figures, we'll be looking at an example of this shortly. Um, you need to be able to use symmetry. Um, where appropriate um, and you won't need to do integration in this case all of the um, uh, figures that you'll be dealing with uh, will be covered in the formula book or will be symmetrical. Um, you also need to be able to uh, work on simple cases of equilibrium of a plane uh, lamina so we tend to call these hanging and toppling questions and again we'll look at an example of this in just a moment. So some of the uh, basics on centre of mass. Um, this is an excerpt from the uh, formula booklet uh, for Edexcel showing um, the location of the centre of mass for the triangular lamina, two thirds of the way along the median from the vertex, the circular arc formula and the sector of a circle formula. I just wanted to pick up on the um, triangular lamina version. I've shown two classic triangles here. All of the triangles that you'll deal with in Edexcel M2 will be either isosceles or right angled um, and this is so that you know that on the isosceles one the center of mass will always be on the line of symmetry down the middle and a third of the way up the height of the triangle um, from the base. Similarly for a right angled triangle if you uh, take a line which is a third of the way up the short side and a third of the way up the middle sized side the two perpendicular edges basically the centre of mass will be at the point where those two lines cross, so a third of the way along in each direction. That will locate the centre of mass. Um, and as I say, all of the triangles that you meet will be either isosceles or right angled so that you can locate the centre of mass easily like this. Um, I'm, I strongly recommend when you're working through centre of mass questions to use um, the uh, table of values um, such as I've shown you here. Um, I suggest that when you're looking at composite bodies you list the components of the composite body in the first column and then the total of, their, of uh, those components underneath. Put the individual masses and the distances from the axis that you're considering in here and you've got to do this in two dimensions then uh, list the distances from both of the axes that you're considering. Um, and then finally to mention that for hanging and toppling questions, again we'll do an example of this in just a moment, don't forget to draw the vertical onto the diagram so that you know which angle you're looking for in the question that you're working on. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here from a past paper. If you're playing along at home and would like to work through this uh, yourselves, uh, this is a good point to pause the recording. Uh, when you're ready to hear the explanation, you can restart the recording again. Okay, so we have this triangular lamina. It's important to notice here that it says it's uniform. That means that the um, mass per unit area is the same throughout. And it means basically that we can use the area of each part of the composite body as an analog for the mass of that section. So let's set up our little um, table of values here. So the parts that I'm going to consider are first of all the rectangle A, B, D, E. That's this large rectangle that forms the main part of the uh, body here. And I'm also going to consider the triangle B, C, D, which you notice here is isosceles. And then I'm also going to look at the total in here. I said that the next column needs to be masses. So as I say, we can use the area of each of these shapes as an analogue for the mass. So the area for this rectangle is 8a squared, and the area for the triangle, half base times height, so that's half times 2a times a, which is a squared, which means the total mass of the lamina is 9a squared. The next column is the distance of the centre of mass 
of each of the uh, objects from the axis that we're delivering. Well, we're looking at the distance of the centre of mass of the lamina from AE, so that's what we're going to put into our table, distance of the centre of mass of each of these elements from AE. So obviously for the rectangle, I hope it's obvious, for the rectangle that's going to be distance 2A away from AE, halfway across the lamina. For BCD, it's going to be 4A, that's all the way across the rectangle, plus a third of the height of this isosceles triangle here. So it's going to be a third of the way along that line A there, so A over 3. And if we simplify that a little bit, I think that gives me um, 13A over 3. And then for the total, we're just going to call that X bar, that's the value that we're looking for. Don't forget to tell the examiner which axis you're working with. So we're going to say taking moments about an axis along AE. OK, and then on the left hand side we take the moments of each of the component parts. So that's going to be 8A squared times 2A for the rectangle plus A squared times 13A over 3 for the triangle, and that's going to be equal to the total 9a squared times x bar for the moment of the whole object. If we simplify that down a little bit uh, and divide through by uh, 9a squared, we end up here with x bar, I think, is um, 67a over 27. Okay, and that gives our distance from AE. We then move into what we call a hanging or toppling question. In this case, it's a hanging question. The lamina is freely suspended from A, so the pivot is here, and it hangs in equilibrium. Well, in order for it to hang in equilibrium, the centre of mass of the object is going to have to be directly below the um, point that it's pivoted at. We know that the um, centre of mass of the lamina is going to be a little bit to the right of the middle of the rectangle here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in a straight line that's going to represent vertical, well hopefully an approximately straight line, that's going to be my vertical because the weight of the um, uh, lamina, the overall weight of the lamina must act through the centre of mass here and it must also act through the point of contact because otherwise um, it's going to um, have a, uh, an unbalanced moment and it will swing, but at the moment it's going to stay stable um, so that force must act directly through both of those points. If we want to find the angle between AB and that downward vertical, this is the angle we're looking for in here, which I'm going to call theta. And symmetry allows us to put in this uh, right angle triangle here. We know that the distance of the centre of mass from AE is our um, uh, 61A over 27 that we found in the previous question. We know this is A from the diagram, so we can do a straightforward tan theta equals A over 61 over 27 and the A's cancel, pop it into your calculator and I believe that gives you an angle 23.9 degrees to one decimal place in there. Okay so onwards to the statics topic. <clears throat> in the statics section we're going to need to use um, the centre of mass to some extent. You also need to be familiar with the idea of the moment of a force and also uh, the idea of equilibrium of rigid bodies. Problems are going to involve parallel and non-parallel forces, but those are all coplanar, so all of the examples that we're going to deal with in the statics section are going to be in a single plane, two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional. Um, and we're going to have a lot of questions that involve rods or ladders, things resting against walls or on smooth or horizontal ground, uh, rough, sorry, rough or smooth horizontal or vertical ground, or slopes. So here are some of the basics that we need to remember for statics. Um, first of all, statics contains no new material. Um, it's only going to use techniques that we've covered in previous parts of the course. It's just going to um, bring them all together in this particular topic. Absolutely crucial for all statics questions, a good diagram. Uh, you need to make sure that your diagram shows all of the forces um, including watching out for any hidden forces, particularly things like contact forces are often um, not necessarily obvious to start off with. So all forces need to go onto the diagram and particularly watch out for any that might be uh, sort of hidden or not immediately obvious. 
a little reminder about splitting forces into components. So when you uh, bend a force through an angle, uh, the component that you get is r cosine theta. When you bend a force away from the angle, the component you get is r sine theta. Um, you may have other ways of remembering that one. This is the shorthand that I like to use. Do look out for keywords in statics questions. So limiting on the point of maximum and minimum, all of those are keywords that are going to um, distinguish between whether f is less than or equal to mu r, uh, which is the case in general equilibrium, or f is specifically equal to mu r. Um, that happens when um, it's on the point of slipping or when friction is limiting, where it's just about to move, where mu is minimum or maximum, etc. That's the situation where f equals mu r. Generally, unless it says one of these keywords, f is less than or equal to mu r. We just need to be a little bit cautious on uh, which situation you're dealing with. When you're choosing the method to use, you've got um, a selection box of techniques that you can use, um, particularly we're often choosing between taking moments and then you decide which point to take moment about, moments about um, and um, uh, balancing forces in um, two perpendicular directions. Okay. Um, so when you're selecting which of those methods you use, you're often choosing a method that avoids an unknown force in that particular situation. So, um, for example, if you wanted to avoid a contact force, you could take moments about the point through which um, that force acts, and that would mean that you would avoid, you wouldn't need to use it in the calculation at all. Do watch out for Pythagorean triples. Exam writers do love those Pythagorean triples in there, so just watch out for those appearing in questions. They can often help you out uh, with your calculations um, and simplify them down. So let's take a look at an example. Um, as before here, if you're uh, playing along at home and you'd like to pause at this point um, and work through the question yourself, that'd be fine. Um, please do start again when you're uh, ready to see the solution. So we have our uniform plank, weight 100 newtons and length 4 meters, resting in equilibrium, etc. So just looking at our diagram here, we've got a key word in the question, the word uniform. That means that the uh, mass is uniformly distributed along the um, length of the plank, but particularly it means that we can locate the point at which the weight is um, appears to act. So that's where what our 100 newton force acts, and that's at a distance two meters from the base of the plank, the end of the plank, um, because it's uniform. Um, so that's our first force that we can put in. Um, you're told that the plank is just resting with the end A on rough horizontal ground. So if it's just resting here, then we can put in a vertical reaction force at that point, which we can call R. It's also resting on the point C here, and because it's tangential to the um, uh, drum surface here, the cylindrical drum, we can put a reaction force in at C that's perpendicular to the plank. It's uh, The reaction force always acts perpendicular to the surfaces in contact, um, so in this case it's going to have to act sort of radially outward on the cylindri cylindrical drum. Down at the bottom here, the, the surfaces in contact, the, one, the surface that you can see if you like is the ground and it's horizontal, so the reaction force is going to act vertically upwards. It tells you that the um, cylindrical drum is smooth, so no other forces act at this contact point here, but it does tell you that um, the ground here at A is rough. So there must be some kind of frictional force acting here. We need to decide carefully which direction that acts in. Well, all of the forces in the diagram are vertical except for a component of S. And there is a component of S acting in the right to left direction. That must be balanced by the only other horizontal component, uh, the horizontal force in the diagram, which has got to be F. So friction has got to act in the direction um, left to right as it is on here in order to counteract that component of S there. That's the only way that this would stay in equilibrium. OK, again, keywords. We're looking for a least possible value of U. We said that minimum was a keyword here. All right, so if we're looking for the least possible value of mu, we're looking for something that's on the point of slipping 
just only just enough friction in order for it to stay in place so on the point of slipping we know that friction is limiting so we know that f equals mu r and this makes our work a little bit easier okay so then looking at the diagram if we've got to find mu it looks from this calculation here as if we're going to need to know f and r as well okay well let's have a look see if we uh, resolve vertically in order to find r we're going to come across needing a component of s uh, similarly if we work horizontally so we can find f again we're going to need to know something about s so whichever way we cut it at some point we're going to need to evaluate s I think the easiest way to do this is to try and avoid r and f altogether to start off with and we do this by taking moments about a okay so moments about a in here okay so R and F both act through A, so neither of them has a moment about A. We do need to work on the 100 Newton weight though. So that's going to be 100 multiplied by 2, that's the distance. And we also need to multiply by the component here. Well, 100 Newtons makes an angle of, uh, 90, uh, sorry, of alpha with the perpendicular to the um, plank. So that's going to be 100 times 2 times cosine alpha that's going to be equal then to the moment of s acting in the other direction that's going to be 3 is the distance from a times s and then because s is perpendicular to the plank we don't need to break it down into any further components we can just go with s equals um, a third of this expression here so s equals 200 over 3 now cos alpha we're given the value for um, sine alpha as being a third here so here's a little trick that you can use if you know that sine alpha is a third, that's opposite over hypotenuse, is a third, then the missing side in the triangle here is going to be, using Pythagoras, is um, root 3 squared minus 1 squared, so root 8 here. That means that cos alpha is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, that's root 8 over 3. So our value of s is going to be, or just simplifying that third a little bit, that's going to be 400 root 2 over 9. So we've got a value for s. That now means that we can work in the vertical direction to get r, in the horizontal direction to get f, and then that should mean that we've got enough information to be able to find mu. Let's go horizontally first because it's simpler. Fewer forces here. All of f in the horizontal direction must be equal to the component of s. And uh, let's just check which component of s that is. This is going to be alpha in here, so it's going to be f equals s cos alpha. So 400 root 2 over 9 multiplied by another root 8 over 3. And if we simplify that down a little bit, I think that's going to give us... Um, oh, have I made a mistake there? Yes, sorry, my mistake. I'm working in the wrong direction there, sorry. That should be sine, because we're working in the horizontal direction. So this should be a third. Apologies there. Okay, that's going to um, give us um, 400 root 2 over 27. <coughs> that's our value for the friction. Apologies for the mistake there. Uh, in the vertical direction, we're going to have upwards. We've got R this time plus S. And it is cos alpha this time round. Sorry about the earlier error and downwards 100 newtons f has no effect in that horizontal direction so r is going to be 100 minus 400 root 2 over 9 cos alpha we know is uh, 2 root 2 over 9 I'm sorry 2 root 2 over uh, 2 root 2 over 3 <coughs> let's just simplify that a little bit so 100 minus uh, the root 2 times root 2 is 2, times another 2 is 4, so I think that comes out 1600 over 27. Okay, so we've now got f, we've now got r. In order to find mu, we can say mu is equal to f over r. We can divide one by the other, and I think, as I say, if you're playing along at home, you should get a value for mu of 0 0.514 to three significant figures.
Okay, well, thank you for watching. I hope you found that useful. Um, I strongly recommend that if you have a moment, you take a look at the Further Maths Support Programme home website, where there's lots of information about how the FMSP supports schools and colleges and uh, students working in the Further Maths area. Hope you found it useful. Thank you and goodbye.